It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The concept of the liberal democracy is generally based on capitalistic markets along with respect for individual freedoms and human rights and equality in the face of the law. The rise of financial capital and in its efforts to deregulate financial markets, however, raises the question whether liberal democracy is a sustainable form of government. Sooner or later, democratic institutions make way for the interests of large capital to supersede. Political economist John Weeks recently gave this year's a David Gordon Memorial Lecture at the meeting of the American Economic Association in Philadelphia, where he addressed these issues with a talk titled Free Markets and the Decline of Democracy. Joining us now is John Weeks. He joins us from London to discuss the issues raised in his lecture. You can find a link to this lecture just below the player. And John is, as you know, Professor Emeritus of the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies and author of Economics of the 1%, How Mainstream Economics Serves the Rich, Obscure Reality and Distorts Policy. John, good to have you back on The Real News. Thank you very much for having me. John, let me start with your talk. Your talk describes a struggle between efforts to create a democratic control over the economy and the interest of capital, which seeks to subjugate government to the interest, uh, its own interests. So in your assessment, it looks like this is a losing battle for democracy. Explain this further. Yes, I think that um, Marx in Capital, on verse volume of Capital, refers to a concept called bourgeois right, by which he meant that uh, you said it in the introduction that uh, in a capitalist society there is a formal equality uh, that uh, mimics the relationship of, of exchange. Every commodity uh, looks uh, uh, equal in exchange, and, and there is a uh, system of ownership that uh, you might say, is the uh, uh, shadow of that. I think more important in the early stages of, of uh, development of capitalism or development of factories, that you, those institutions, those factories, prompted the growth of trade unions and workers' struggles in general. Those workers' struggles were key to the development, the further development of democracy, freedom of speech, uh, a whole range of rights, uh, the uh, uh, right to vote. However, with the development of finance capital, you get quite a different um, uh, dynamic uh, within the capitalist uh, uh, system. And let me say, I, I don't want to romanticize the, uh, uh, the early uh, period of, uh, of capitalism, but you did have struggles, mass struggles for rights. Finance capital uh, produces nothing productive. It doesn't do anything productive. So what finance capital does basically is it redistributes the uh, uh, income, uh, the wealth, the what Marx would call a surplus value from other sectors of society uh, to itself. And it, it employs relatively, uh, relatively few people. So that dynamic of the capital, uh, industrial capital, generating its uh, uh, antithesis, namely the rise of the uh, labor movement, doesn't occur on, under financial capital. In addition, financial capital leads to inequality, and that inequality, in, as you've seen in the United States and in Europe and many other places, it, it increases and increases, and, and, and suddenly, not suddenly, but bit by bit, people begin to realize that they aren't getting their share. And the that means that the government, the, the, the government pr to protect capitalism, must use force to maintain the finance, the order of uh, uh, financial capital. And I think uh, Trump is the uh, uh, fulfillment of that. And I think uh, uh, there are other examples too, which I can, uh, which I can go into. So basically my argument is that with the rise of finance and its uh, unproductive uh, uh, activities, 
you get the uh, decline in uh, uh, living standards and the vast majority. And in order to maintain order in such a system where people no longer think that they're sort of getting their share. And so justice doesn't become a just distribution doesn't become the uh, 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 the reason why people support the system. Increasingly, it has to be done through force. All right, John, before we get further into the relationship between neoliberalism and democracy, give us a brief summary of what you mean by neoliberalism. You say that it's not really about deregulation as most people usually conceive of it. Um, if that's not what it's about, what is it then? I think that... Um if you think about the uh, uh, the movements in the United States, and as much as I can, I will take examples from the United States, so because most of your listeners will be familiar with those. Beginning in the early part of the 20th century, um, the in the United States, you have reform movements, uh, the uh, uh, the breaking up of the large monopolies, tobacco uh, monopoly, a uh, uh, whole range of Standard Oil, all of that. And then, of course, under Roosevelt, you began to get the regulation of capital uh, <clears throat> uh, in the interest of uh, the majority, much of that driven by uh, Roosevelt's trade union support. So, so that was moving from a system where capital was relatively unregulated to where it was being regulated uh, in the interest of uh, the vast uh, majority. And I also would say, though, <clears throat> Um, uh, I won't go into detail. To a certain extent, it was in, regulated in the interest of capital itself to moderate competition and uh, therefore, uh, like I say, ensure a relatively tranquil uh, in, uh, market environment. Neoliberalism involves not the deregulation of uh, uh, the capitalist system, but the re-regulation of it in the interest of capital. So, so it, it involves moving from a system in which capital is regulated in the interest of uh, stability and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the many to regulation in a way that enhances capital. So this in the regu these regulations get specific about them, uh, restrictions on trade unions, as you, um, uh, on Real News, a number of people have talked about this. The United States now has many restrictions on the organizing of trade unions, which were not present 50 or 60 years ago, making it harder to uh, have a mass movement of labor uh, against capital. Uh, re restrictions on um, the right to demonstrate, a whole range of things. And then within capital itself, <coughs> the... Uh, regulations on the movement uh, of capital that facilitate uh, speculation uh, in uh, uh, international markets. So we have, have, a, have a capitalism which is in which the form of regulation is shifted from <clears throat> the regulation of capital in the interest of labor to regulation of capital in the interest of capital. John, give us a brief summary of the ways in which neoliberalism undermines democracy. Well, I think that there, um, uh, there are many examples, but I'm going to uh, focus on uh, uh, economic policy. Uh, uh, for <clears throat> an obvious case is the um, uh, role of uh, uh, the central bank, in the case of the United States Federal Reserve System, in which reducing its accountability to the public, one way you, uh, one way you can, uh, can do that is by assigning goals to it, with, uh, such as uh, fighting inflation, which then override other goals. Originally, the um, uh, Federal Reserve System, its charter, or not say its terms of reference, if you want to use that uh, phrase, in, included uh, uh, full employment and uh, a stable economy. Uh, the, those have been overridden in more recent legislation, which a great emphasis on the control of inflation. Control of inflation basically means maintaining the, an economy at a 
relatively high level of uh, uh, unemployment or uh, or, or part-time employment, in flexible, uh, flexible employment, where people have relatively few rights at work, and that the central bank becomes a vehicle for enforcing a uh, neoliberal uh, economic policy. Second of all, uh, probably most of your um, um, uh, uh, viewers uh, will not remember the days when we had uh, fixed exchange rates, but we had a world of fixed exchange rates. In those days, that represented, represented a policy which uh, government could, uh, uh, could use to uh, affect its trade and also affect its uh, domestic policy. There have been deregulation of that. We now have floating exchange rates. That takes away a, um, uh, an, a tool, an instrument of economic policy. And in fiscal policy, there, the here it's more ideology than laws, though there are also laws. There is a law requiring um, that uh, the government uh, uh, balance uh, uh, its budget. The, uh, which, uh, but more important than that, the introduction into the public consciousness, you know, I'd say, you might say grinding into the public consciousness, the idea that deficits are a bad thing, government debt is a bad thing, and that uh, that's a completely neoliberal ideology. So in summary, one way that the democracy has been undermined is to take away economic policy from the public realm and move it to the realm of experts. So we have certain allegedly expert guidelines that we have to follow. Inflation should be low. We should not run deficits. The, the national debt should be small. These are things that are just made up ideologically. There is no, uh, there is no technical uh, basis to them. And so in doing that, you might say, the term I like to use is you, you decommission the democratic process in economic policy. John, speaking of ideology, in your talk, you refer to the challenge that fascism posed or poses to neoliberal democracies. Now, it is interesting when you take uh, Europe into consideration and nationalist socialists in Germany, for example, appeal mostly to the working class, um, as does contemporary far right leaders in, in Poland and Hungary, um, that they support uh, more explicit neoliberal agendas. Why would people support a neoliberal agenda that exasperate inequalities and harm public services that they depend on, including jobs? Well, I think that um, to a great extent it is country specific, but I can make generalizations. First, I want to talk about Europe because you raised the uh, case of some European countries. And then I'll uh, uh, make some comments about uh, the United States and Trump, uh, if you want me to. I think in Europe, a combination of three things resulted in the rise of uh, uh, fascism and uh, authoritarian movements which are verging on fascism. Uh, one is that the European integration project, which let me say that I have supported, and I would still prefer Britain not to leave the European Union, but nevertheless, the European Union integration project has been a project run by elites. It has not been a bottom-up uh, process. It has been a process very much run by uh, elite uh, politicians in which <laughs> they get together, I mean, and uh, in uh, under uh, closed door, and they make policies which uh, they subsequently announce. But many of the uh, decisions they come to being extremely, the meaning of them being extremely uh, opaque. So therefore, you had a development in Europe of the European Union, which not from the bottom up, but very much from the top down. You might say just from the top. I'm not sure how much goes down. That's one. The second key factor, I would say for about 20 years in European integration, it was relatively benign elitism. 
because it was social democratic. Uh, it was at the support of the working class or the trade unions at any rate. Then increasingly it began to become neoliberal. So you had an elite project which was turning into a neoliberal project. And specifically what I mean by neoliberal is a where they're generating flexibility rules uh, for the labor market, uh, austerity policies, bank, uh, balanced budgets, low inflation, things I was talking about before. And then the third element, toxic, the most toxic of them, but together they're volatile, is the legacy of fascism in Europe. Every European country, with the exception of Britain, had a substantial fascist movement in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, I can go into why Britain did uh, uh, sometime, but it had to do with a particular class struggle, of the, I mean, class structure of Britain. So uh, Poland, Ironically enough, though, it was one of them, uh, it was overrun uh, by the Nazis and occupied and incorporated into uh, uh, the German uh, uh, Reich. Ironically, it had a very right wing government when, uh, with a lot of sympathies uh, towards fascism when it was invaded in uh, the uh, late summer of uh, 1939. And the uh, France had a, uh, a strong uh, fascist uh, movement. Of course, Italy had a fascist government. And the, uh, uh, Hungary, where now you have a right-wing government, a very strong uh, uh, fascist movement. So, <clears throat> and the incorporation of these countries into the Soviet sphere of influence, Soviet empire, as it were, did not destroy that, uh, uh, that fascism. It certainly suppressed it, but it didn't destroy it. So as soon as the European project began to transform into a neoliberal project, and <clears throat> the, that gathered strength in the early 1990s, I mean, the, the neoliberal aspect of the um, uh, European Union gathered strength in the early 19. Uh, 90s, exactly when you were getting the, quote, liberation of many countries from Soviet rule. <clears throat> and so when you put those together, it led to, <clears throat> it was a uh, rise of fascism waiting to happen, and now it is happening. John, earlier you said you'll factor in Trump. How does Trump fit into this phenomena? I think that, as uh, the real news has pointed out, that um, the... Um, <clears throat> Many of Trump's policies are uh, appear just to be more extreme versions of things that um, uh, uh, George Bush did, and in some cases, not that much different from what Barack Obama did. No, though I, I wouldn't uh, go too deeply into that. I think that that is uh, uh, the most serious. Uh, offenses uh, by Obama that have been carried on by Trump that have to do with the use of drones and uh, uh, military. But at any rate, but there's a big difference from Trump. <clears throat> For the most part, the previous Republican presidents and Democratic presidents accepted the framework of the formal framework of liberal democracy in the United States. It has formally accepted uh, the constraints imposed by the Constitution. Now, of course, they, they probably didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, they did it because they, they saw that the things that they wanted to achieve, the neoliberal goals that they wanted to achieve were perfectly consistent with uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Constitution's uh, uh, framework and guarantees of rights and so on, that <clears throat> most of those uh, uh, rights are guaranteed in a way that's so weak that you, uh, that you didn't have to uh, 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 repeal, you know, the, uh, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution in order to have uh, uh, repressive policies. The difference with Trump is he has complete contempt for all of those constraints. <clears throat> that is, he is an authoritarian. I don't think he's a fascist, not yet, but he is an authoritarian. He does not accept that there are constraints which he should respect, 
their constraints have bothered him and he wants to get rid of them. And he actually takes steps to do so. So what you have in Trump, I think, is a sea change. You have a, you, we've had right wing presidents before, certainly. <clears throat> What's the difference Trump is? He is a right wing president that sees no reason to, res to respect the institutions of democratic government, or even you might say the institution of representative government. I won't even use a term as strong as uh, democratic. That lays the basis for an explicitly authoritarian United States. And I say that we're beginning to see the vehicle by which this will occur, the restriction on voting rights. Of course, that was going on before Trump. <clears throat> it does in a more aggressive way. And I think the uh, uh, soon we will have a um, uh, Supreme Court that uh, he will have that will be quite lenient with his uh, uh, tendencies towards uh, uh, authoritarian rule. All right, John. So let's end uh, the segment with what can be done. I mean, what must be done to prevent neoliberal interests from undermining democracy? And who do you believe is leading the struggle for democracy now? And what is the right strategy that people should be fighting for? Well, one thing I think uh, where I begin is that I think progressives, um, as Real News uh, represents, and uh, 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 Bernie Sanders and all the people that support him, and uh, <coughs> Jeremy Corbyn over here. I'll come back to talk about a bit about Jeremy. The we must be explicit that we view democracy by what you mean the participation of people at the grassroots their participation in their government, we view that as a goal. It's not merely a technique or a tool, which, uh, you know, uh, what was it that uh, Erdogan so infamously said, uh, democracy is a, like a, a train, you take it to where you want to go and then you get off. <clears throat> the progressive view is that democracy is what it's all about. <clears throat> Democracy is the way that we build the present and we build the future. I'm quite fortunate in that I live in perhaps the only large country in the world where there's imminent possibility of a progressive left-wing anti-authoritarian government. Uh, I think that is the monumental importance of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, his uh, 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 his second in command, John McDonnell, and others like Emily uh, Thornberry, uh, who is the uh, foreign secretary. That these people are committed to democracy in the United States. Bernie Sanders is committed to a democracy, and a lot of other people are too. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Warren. So. I think that the struggle in the United States is extremely difficult because of the role of the big money and the media, which you might know more about than I do. But it is a struggle which um, we have to keep at and we have to be um, uh, optimistic uh, uh, about it. Uh, it's a good bit uh, easier uh, uh, over here, but um, as we saw and you reported during the last uh, presidential election, uh, a progressive came very close to being president of the United States. And uh, that I don't think was a one-off event not to be repeated. I think it lays the basis uh, for uh, hope in the future. John, I thank you so much for joining us. And this has been a very insightful discussion and I hope to continue it as opportunities arise and I think there's some interesting developments in the UK with uh, Labour and Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and I think people here in terms of our revolution and followers of Bernie Sanders hasn't really 
uh, you know, capped their revolution yet. It's an ongoing struggle, as you say. There's some possibilities with Lopez Obrador in Mexico leading in the polls now, leading up to their July election. So there's many opportunities to discuss this further, and I hope you can join us then. I would very much like to. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.